the goal this, this morning is to uh, look at examples of um, questions that people address to God as part of tefillot, as part of uh, Mizmorei Tehillim, um, and to, un- to appreciate how they work within prayer. Right? What is the, what rhetorically, uh, what is the function of these, uh, of these questions? Um, we'll start by simply examining some cases in uh, Sefer, two examples from Sefer Tehillim, and I've put some more if people want to look later on. They can look at other examples. I, I believe that they're very similar. I'm not going to give every example. And then to contextualize them, we'll look at some examples outside of Sefer Tehillim of people addressing questions to God. Um, then, uh, and my claim will be that these form a, uh, they, they are part of a broader um, motif in biblical prayer um, that relates uh, that in, sorry incorporates um, legal motifs, legal imagery, um, and I, what I call the idea of praying legally. The idea that you use legal imagery, specifically the courtroom, as a way of talking to God. This is part of a bigger uh, motif in the Hebrew Bible in general, in the Tanakh in general, where you have... Um, the communication between humanity and God takes place through the arena of um, of the legal of the, of the law court uh, and the law more generally, right? So, if you want to be very very general, the main uh, connection between God and Israel in the Tanakh is through a set of laws, right? So that can be the most obvious point. But even more refined than that, um, when God speaks to humanity through the Nevi'im, we are, we are familiar with, um, uh, in various places, we have Nevi'im that present lawsuits of God to Israel. Okay? And that would be another time we would have another shiur on that, on the communication from, if you will, top down, from God to Israel via the Nevi'im. The, our purpose today is to look the other way, the, the direction from God, from Israel back to God. And the, incorporation of um, various motifs of law, um, specifically law, uh, lawsuit motifs, into, uh, into tefillah. Um, we could do any number of these examples. The most, most obvious ones are not the ones we're going to look at today. One of the most obvious ones are examples of Sefer Tehillim, which just simply say, judge my case, O God. Shoftani Hashem. Right? Judge my case. Um, there are numerous examples of that. You have it in Tehillim. You have an example in Echa Perek Gimel. There are a number of examples like that. But that's just the beginning. We have other ones. And my claim will be that the questions are part of that. The questions, um, to demonstrate that point, I will, will so, and once we've looked at the examples in uh, the Tefillot, and we'll talk about what, well, what, how do they function within, how are they, you know, how do they fit into the text that they were looking at. And then we'll ask, the, the, we'll demonstrate in a number of places and using specifically the contribution, my contribution to this whole discussion, uh, will be that we'll look at some examples of these from outside the Tanakh as well, from, um, from Mesopotamia in Akkadian cuneiform, uh, that uh, where we have questions being used, I would claim in a similar manner. Okay? So um, what I suggest we do is we uh, begin with the quest, we begin with the Tehillim, just so that we've uh, looked at the phenomenon, and we'll probably come back to them at various points. We'll go through the, the other tefillot, and then we'll come back and we'll look at the ancient Near East, and then we'll come back to the Mizmorei Tehillim and suggest, uh, um, suggest perhaps a, 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 an interpretation based on that. So our first source is Tehillim Kafbet, and uh, we don't have time in an hour to do an entire analysis of all of Tehillim Kafbet, which is quite, not, not, so, not as long as, is much longer than this, not much, but it's longer than uh, Aleph to Chet, um, but the question occurs right at the front, right? So we're going to look, we're going to not look at the first verse, which is Al Hayal Tashachar. We'll just um, look at Pasuk Bet. Eli, Eli, Lama Azavtani, right? right? Uh, my Lord, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And there it is, right there, right? There is our question, right there. There it is, um, a why question. And, uh, and I would suggest we read it, the rest of the verse, together with that Lama. Right, so, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh, Lord, oh God, my God, oh my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Um, and I'm gonna, um, at various points, I'm going to deviate from the um, translation here. This is just the I prepared. This, I was instructed to prepare this with Safaria, so I did. But that 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 marries you to a translation. So, yeah. 
Um, so that's okay. Um, we can, you know, we're independent thinkers and we can uh, proceed on. With, with you, just a quick side question. Yes. Any idea why they wanted you to do it from Safari? I, I think it's just very, it's just, it's just simpler. Um, it, it, it's already, I rem, I'm old enough to remember the cut and paste Xerox. Yes. And that was better than before they had Xerox. Right. So there you go. Okay. So, we, we, so we're, we're, um, we're going to be, I'll, I'll try to use this as much as possible, but I may, you know, ad lib it at some point or make some decisions. Okay. Um, Lama Azavtani. And then I would say we read the Lama again. Lama Rachok Mishuati Divrei Shagati. And that's what the translation here has done. Why so far from delivering me and from my anguished roaring? Okay. Um, were this a you know full blown seminar on Tehillim, we'd talk a lot about the problems of syntax here. But we're not going to. If they're in, you know if you want, we can talk about it later on, perhaps. Elohai, um, ekra yomam ta'ane. My God, I cry by day; you answer not. Velaila velo dumiali, and by night you have and have no respite. Again, we have here the. Um, what the medievals would call Mosheikh Atmo Veacher Imo, it pulls its own plus another, right? Elohai, Ekra, Yomam, Velo Ta'ane, Vilaila, Velo Dumiali. Something has to be read twice, which is what? Here? Uh, you have to read Ekra, Yoma, Ekra, right? Elohai, Ekra. My God, I cry. And then by day you answer not. Vilaila, Velo Dumiali, and have no respite at night either, right? So, okay, that's how this verse goes. Uh, what we call double duty parallelism, right? The beginning, the beginning part of the sentence uh, does double duty. It works twice. Same thing, actually, uh, I would say with the Lama in verse 2, just interestingly. You are the Holy One enthroned, praise of Israel. Uh, in, your, in you, our fathers trusted. They trusted you and you rescued them. They cried out to you. And they were saved, they escaped, they, they trusted you, and were not disappointed. Ve'anochi, I am a worm, less than human, tolat, velo ish, cherpatat amu v'zuiam. Kol ro'ai yal iguli, yaftiru v'safa, yani urosh. Okay, so all my, those who see me, mock me, they curl their lips, <coughs> they shake their heads. Um, and the Mizmor goes on uh, to enumerate some other, you know, some problems. And of course, the, as very often in um, Mizmor Eit Tehillim, um, right, you have a, uh, if, if, if we have a, an individual speaker and uh, who is beset with problems, right? The world, it's, you know, this kind of me versus the world, um, which is the majority of Sefer Tehillim. What we would call, if I had a blackboard, I would put it on the blackboard. I don't, so it's okay. I'll just say it. Uh, what we call the lament or the complaint of the individual. That's the sort of technical you know, jargon that us professors like to use, right? So the complaint of the individual, right? The individual is, um, and, we, and we'll see in a minute, we'll see the complaint of the community, or the communal lament in a second. Um, but the com complaint of the individual, the individual is me versus the world, right? I'm, the world is out there, everybody hates me, nobody loves me, and I'm, in, I'm feeling awful, right? Well, maybe. I'm going to go out and we, 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 we worms, maybe. Yeah, it's, a studio, it's, a it's a song. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Okay, I'm going to go out in the garden and eat worms, maybe. Uh, but I'm, I'm not, it's not, not so much a threat for what's coming next, right? I'm not, going, I'm not threatening God to do something. More I'm asking God to uh, help me, right? And I enumerate the, the problems. Um, we're going to zero in on the nature of that question at the beginning. So what do we, so let's just talk about a little bit about what, um, uh, what's the point of this question? I mean, I'm going to sort of ask, I'll ask the, uh, you know, the numerous who are here. Um, what does it do here? What's the speaker's tone in Pasuk Bet? And in the, you know, given what I just told you about the laments of the individual, what, you know, what is the tone of that question? It's a complaint, okay, right? He's saying, you know, why have you, Lama Azokani, and because I'm reading it kind of constantly, but it's saying, you've abandoned me, yet every day I cry your mom, I cry Lila. Right. So I, I, you've abandoned me, right? And I'm, I, you know, I've been at your door you know, complaining, and you're not answering. Why? And, and the, um, let's establish, let's agree that there's not really an answer expected. Right. Right? Meaning, not that the, guy, not that the speaker doesn't expect a response from God in the macro of he's going to eventually save, right? But the answer, why are you, uh, why have you abandoned me, 
um, is not, if God were to say, I've abandoned you because I'm taking care of 16 million other things on this earth, that's not the point, yeah. right? This is a, the, it's right, personal. it's a, well, it's also, it's also, I'm not expecting a, an answer from God to the specific why, right? Frida, if I asked you, you know, why did you wear blue today, right? You could tell me a good answer, right? And you could say, right? Or you could say, or if I asked you, you know, why is two plus two four, you would also tell me an answer, right? Right? Okay. And I don't think this is the why question that is expecting an answer, right? This is a why. We'll have to decide what that why is, well, you said. Wouldn't the answer be, like, I, I don't think it's even got to say, I, I haven't answered you because you've sinned. He's saying right. why, and then the, expect, the expectation is an answer, that you will answer me from what I need. Right. So, right. Let's call it respond or whatever. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Save. Yes. Well, this so. question, this is a, a personal question, it seems. It's, it's why have you abandoned me? Right. It's not... What about the six million? No, 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 no. It's not a theological question. Uh, no, it is not. It is not it's good. It's not a theor- It's not a theological question. I like the phrase "cri de cour, Right? It is a call, a cry, yeah. and it's not. And I think it's more than it's. And it, we, let's establish it's what we call a rhetorical question. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not expecting um, a factual answer. Right? God could say, "I have abandoned you because there are." you know, a million of uh, one other things on my plate at the moment, right? Wait your turn. That's not what God can say here. Or not well, with, well, with the person responds. I'm wondering, I mean, it's a creed and cure, but it's also, I think he does want an answer. I'm thinking of somebody I know who's going through uh, stuff yeah, yeah. for whatever reason at this stage in his life. Right. And you can see it's a creed and cure, some of the stuff he talks on. Okay. <laughs> whatever. But I think he does... Want an answer. Well, I think the speaker wants a response, a and response. and wants yes. the as uh, John was saying that he wants a um, he wants action more than you know facts to respond to this question. Lama azavtani, and I'm going to push us a little bit, but let's go to the next source, and we'll see if we can continue to see. Maybe there's something here. Um, let's just remember Lama azavtani, right? Okay, why ha- and. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this again in a minute, but let's look at the next page. The next page, um, let, just take a second to look at it yourself. This is a selection from um, chapter 44, from Tehilim Mem Dalid, and um, if you look for a quick second at it, you'll notice what's the big difference between the, the language in, verse one, in, in the first example from Psalm 22, from Tehilim Kaf Bet, and the example here. Just, you know, just look at it, you know, whether you read it in English or in Hebrew, notice the pronoun. Right. Okay. What's the difference between what's the difference? What? It's communal. It's communal. Right. This is this is us. Right. It's still first person. Right. It's someone talking about themselves, um, and it is. Um, but it is us. Right. Kol zot ba'at nu velo shechachanucha lo shikarnu bivritecha. All this has come upon us. Yet we have not forgotten you. And I like that. Yet we have not forgotten you. Right. That the contrastive there. And nor have we been false to your covenant. Our hearts have not gone astray, nor have our feet swerved from your path. Even though, right, you cast us crushed to where the sea monster is. Let's go with that for now. And you covered us with deepest darkness. Here we have an oath. Okay? And if we were talking another shiur, I would talk about why I don't love this translation, but we'll be okay with it for now. If we forgot, we swear that we have not forgotten right? the name of our God. This is an im that is a lishon shua, a, a language of, um, of oath. Right? If we have forgotten, vanifros kapenu le'elzar, and then here you have to just imagine that there is no, um, you don't have to imagine, you have to say that there is no completion to the sentence. Right? I'm going to take that on. For today, we're not going to go through the grammar the, the, and the argumentation. It's an article forthcoming, if you really want to know. But, um, but what I would say is that I would say this is like, this is like a regular oath in the Hebrew Bible, that which you get the condition without the, um, without the second part, you know, without what happens if it's fulfilled. If we forgot, so we swear we have not forgotten the name of our God, nor have we spread forth our hands to a foreign God. God, not, I would say God must surely search this out. Right? He will search this out, or he has to examine this, for he knows the um, secrets of the heart. We are slain because of you. 
Nechshavnu kitzon tivcha. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Ura, rouse yourself. Lama tishan Adonai. Why do you sleep? Hakitza al tiznach lanetzach. Wake yourself. Do not reject us forever. Lama fanecha tastir tishkach onyenu velachatzenu. Why do you hide your face, ignoring our affliction and distress? Kishachal e'afar nafshenu. While we lie, pros- we lie prostrate in the dust. Davika la aretz bitnenu. Our body clings onto the ground. Kuma ezratalanu ufdenu lemaan chastecha. Arise and help us, redeem us as befits your faithfulness. Okay, we'll go with that. So, um, I've again selected here. What comes before is an actual, there's actually a lot of description of quite similar to what we see in chapter 22. You have a contrast between what, what used to be and what is now, as well as a long uh, description of woes, right? You know, uh, specifically, you know, kind of war and our, the foreign nations are doing bad stuff to us. Um, and um, now, so let's, um, uh, what's the, uh, what, 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 what's here in 22? Where are the questions, first of all? Yes, 24, 25, kavdalet, kavhei, right? Lama tishan, so again, we have those why questions, right? Lama tishan Hashem, hakitza, lama panecha tastir. And then we would even suggest in the second half, lama tishkachon yenu velachatzen, right? Why do you forget our, or ignore our uh, affliction and our distress, okay? Um, now, uh, so what, again, what's the tone here of these questions? They, again, they seem more personal than theological. In the sense of, meaning they're not asking for a... a, a well, they, they're a little more theological than the previous. Right. Why do you hide your face? I mean, okay, right. It, was it something I said? You know, right. Was it a general thing? You're mad at everybody? Right. <laughs> what do we do? You know? Right, okay. Um, what is there, do you think, it's, is it similar to... Uh, I mean, I think it's similar to what we saw in uh, in chapter twenty two. Right? Okay, it's a complaint. Right? Okay, good. Um, and can we get even further than that? Who's responsible for what's happening here in chapter twenty two? Uh, well, is it that God makes these things happen, or God lets these things happen? Okay, but either way, it's, it's still God. And the buck stops here. Right. So that's very important. Right. That what what Frida points out here is. Critically, right, the nation does not um, uh, say that they bear any responsibility, quite the opposite, right? Number one, they say it's you, right? And if you read the entire Mismore, it's even more pronounced than it is here, or it's slightly more, it becomes more, you know, the effect, the impact is quite long, okay? Um, The problem is not them. How do we know the problem is not them from the text that we've... Well, okay, right, well, let's... You know, we are, we, are in a, we are in a state of prayer here, meaning with, with the text, right? So the texts are presenting their case. We are familiar. They could say anything they want, right? They're not saying, oh, it's us, we did something bad, right? You know, that this is not slichot, right? The, as we know them, right? This, right? We, exactly, right? Dafka, at the beginning, it says, we have not gone astray. Correct, correct. We did not go astray. We swear to that, right? Yeah, we take an oath, right? This is, this is... Um, audiences, Jewish audiences find this, Ashkenazi Jewish audiences find this very shocking. Um, some audiences find this shocking because um, we're used to, I mean, I include myself here, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're used to thinking about um, the dialogue with God as being this kind of, should we say, a you're always right, I'm always wrong. Right, Asham nu bagad nu. Right, exactly. Mea kulpa, mea kulpa, mea. Right, okay. Um, uh, whatever. Right, all of that. Right, Asham nu bagad nu, and so on. Now that it does exist in the Tanakh, but not here, nor in Perek Kafbet. Right, in you have that in. Um, we can talk about that another time. Right, what we, what we would call people call penitential prayer, where those come from places like in. They're they're found. There's a question whether it's in Tehillim or not, but there are certainly some in. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 and Ezra Nehemiah. Again, there's some there, so, and, and Divrei Hayamim to some extent. There is some place for that. Not here. Okay? okay. Yeah? And it's not only that they they claim that they're fine. They also say it's in, in Kabbalah. Im shachachnu, right. Like, he, God, you would know. 
Well, it's not even, that's, I, would, I would say even more than that, right? I don't think God would know that, right? Yes, im shachachnu is, is an oath, right? We did not do that. We swear we did not. And then, Elohim let God investigate, right? I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a conditional sentence there. Uh, it, it's not them saying, we know we didn't because if we did, you would, you would show it in some way. Yes, okay. right. Okay, so that's possibly a, one reading of this. I actually think it's actually not even that. Yeah. I think it's actually, we swear we didn't do it. And, it, and not if we did, but go ahead, God, just try to investigate, right? Just investigate. We'll try, we, we challenge you here to do that, right? We challenge you to investigate. Um, in, in verse 22, in, para, in Pasuk Kafbet. So if you could, it's just simpler if you sit on this side. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, um, so, right. So, and, and notice verse 23, Pasuk Kaf Gimel, Alecha horagnu kol hayom, right? And I like the translation here. It is for your sake, right? Because why, why, why do I like the translation? Because it, it does in English nicely what the Hebrew does here. It is because of you, right? It is because of you. Not just, they want to kind of, because you could write in English, for your sake, we are slain all day long, right? But rather they say, it is for your sake that we are slain. So the English here reflects the Hebrew quite nicely with its, emphatic tone, right? And so again, so as Freda, Freda said before, right? Um, Alecha, we, who's to blame here? It's definitely not the nation, right? The speakers don't feel that they are, that they are to blame. Rather the opposite, they're saying, right, you, right? And um, similarly, if we go back to, the, to chapter 22, which we, you know, kind of quickly look back, right? Um, what is that? I think it's a similar... Uh, situation there. Um, certainly in the question part, in two and three, right? Why? Because there again, Lama Azavtani, why have you abandoned me? Okay? And um, he doesn't, ex if you keep looking into, if you look at the rest of the uh, Mizmor, I didn't, I didn't put the whole thing in there, if you look at the rest of this chapter and in chapter 44, they never say anything of like, oh, I did something wrong. Right? They never say, oh, we, I, either I or we did something wrong. Rather, the problem, a problem is you, right? And moreover, in, what, what, what's the point of this verse four, five, six, um, what's the point of that? In, in chapter 22, Pesukim Dalet, Hey, and Vav. What, what, what do they do? What do they add here? Look at the, look at the, look at the, the text in chapter 22, the first source we looked at, four, five, and six. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm holding them, and I've got, I've got all the cards in my hand. Um, so in verses four, five, and six, what the what what are they doing there? They almost kind of there's a little bit of a of an aside, right? What do they talk about there? I mean, it's like a it's a lot like our our potential kind of to in that remember us for the sake of our fathers. Is that what it is? I, they, right, like we like I'm crying to you. I know you are. God. Uh, yeah. Okay. You have told you, Israel. Fine. And you, in our like in our in our fathers, you trusted. Mm -hmm. they, like you did this, so you should just as you did this for them, you should do this for me. Ah. Okay. So that's a little bit different, right? Okay. So just as you did this, you should do this for me. That's part of this. What else is there? Also, why? What's what's what lies behind the just as you did this for them, right? What lies behind that is. You are known to do this, right? I expect you to do this. I've got the historical record suggests to me that you should do this, right? Um, it's not that, um, you know, I'm a member of that community and therefore, you know, because so I'm, you know, and, the, and I think the seven where it says, I am less than human, whatever that is there. I don't think that means, be, you know, I'm not worthy. What I think that means is that I am in such a bad state that I am like, like, not, like you know, I've been reduced to inhuman. Okay? Um, certainly the rest part, of, the second part of it suggests that. Second part of verse 7, Pasuk Zion. So um, critically then, right, so let's, let's build this up a little bit again. Let's, take a, let's remind ourselves of all the pieces. So we have the question, right, which, which you know, ex suggests and expect, you know, uh, tells God, why have you done something that we don't like, right? In either Kafbet or Mem Dalid, um, and enumerates something that should have happened, right? Um, you're not answering. Right? It also gives you God's track record, right? If I had, you know, if, judging from your past, you know, all these, all these other times you did this, why not now too? Now in 44, we, I didn't put in the section where they do that. Okay? It, the, if you, if you read from the beginning of chapter 44, you will see that they actually talk a lot about that. Um, and, um, and then 
in what we what we what we don't have in 22, which we do have in 44, which I think we can kind of, you know, I'm, I'm reading them together today. Um, in 44, we have this very clear statement of I did nothing wrong. We did nothing wrong, right? We swear to it. And really, it places, the, these more places blame squarely at God. You did this. Notice how many times, you know, dikitanu and so on and so forth. So the question is, what is the tone of this quest, of these questions? Lama panecha tastir or, um, lama tishan, right? Um, so, uh, what are, what are the things that follow the Lama? Right? What are the, what are the, why, what? Right? What are these things that you, you what, what do they think, what, what, what do they all have in common in chapter 22 and chapter 23 and chapter 44? What, you know, in the biggest, broadest strokes, what is it about those things that follow the Lama that, you know, what, what characterizes them? Are they things that we want or things that we don't want? There are things that we wish weren't happening. Correct, right? There are things that we don't, we, we'd never want God to be asleep, yeah. right? We would never want God not to answer, right? We want God to answer. And so the next step to this is to suggest that maybe this is some kind of almost, uh, I'm going to drop the word accusatory, right? The question is somewhat accusatory. And my claim is to, will be for the next half hour to build up the point that this is actually a, um, you know, not just a rhetorical thing. It's not just, you know, you know, it's not simply rhetoric. It's actually legal rhetoric. It is a form of opening a, um, asking the question is a form that you would use to accuse somebody of something, right? And, you know, the, the and to get to the, to, to kind of, you know, get to where we end up going to go, I might suggest that this is how you would, um, confront your legal opponent and perhaps even sue God. So what I want to do now is I want to look at two examples um, for, uh, from other places where you have these kinds of questions, which um, uh, suggest that which we find similarly, right, where you have a similar, why, did you, why are you doing this? And, uh, and to give you some of, the, um, some of the legal valences of this. And then we'll look at one example that's not on the sheet that I'll just kind of read to you, which I, somewhere I have, oh, I know what happened. Okay, which I will read to you um, from uh, another source completely. Um, and then uh, we'll look at some, maybe we'll, if we have time, we'll look at the ancient Near Eastern sources as well. Okay, so um, in Yirmiyahu, right? Yirmiyahu is um, kind of Job's great uncle, if you will, or like great, great grandfather. Um, in some level, Yov uh, certainly learned from Yirmiyahu. And this is probably where the book of Yov got the idea of entering into a lawsuit with God, which is what Yov is doing. Um, it comes for out of Yirmiyahu, and this is probably one of the main places where he where it came from. Sadikata Hashem, you will win, O Lord, ki ariv elecha, if I make a claim against you. Okay? Critically, the, the, the text does a nice job. Lariv here means to make a claim against you. Ach mishpatim adaberotach, even so I will uh, present charges against you. That's very good. Madua derech reshaim tzalecha shalu kol bogedei vage. Right? Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are the workers of treachery at ease? Netatam, gam shorashu, right? You have done all this. You've planted them. They take root. They spread and so on. Karova tabifihem, you are present in their mouths, but far from their thoughts. Even though that all of that's true, yet they, yet they somehow succeed. Vata Hashem yedatani, you note me and observed me. You have tested, or you will test my heart with you. And you know, drive them out like sheep to the slaughter, prepare them for the day of slain. How is this similar to what we've seen so far in Kafbet and Memdalid? Uh, to the, so, what kind of, where's the question here? There's a question. The one thing that's different, though, is that in the first verse, he does admit that God will win. Yes, yeah, but even so, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, right, again, this is, a, this is a, like I say, you know. Um, is, you will win, God says, because I said so, or because you screwed up. Well, but interesting. In, interesting. We don't have an answer here. No, we, we, never, we never get an answer. We but what's similar, what's similar, what's similarity is there? Yeah. Yes, okay. Rasha Vitovlo, Tzadik Viralo. Okay, right. So you have a... Um, the, the theological situational is similar. How about the rhetorical? 
It's also a question of, it's, it's an accusatory question. Of yes, why? Right? It's a madua, it's a lama madua question. I'm not going to get into the, I don't think there's a difference very much between lama and madua. Um, you know, we can, the language can have synonyms and that's okay. Um, madua derech rishayim tzalecha, right? And, it's, and again, it's, an, and it's very critically, it's an accusatory question. Why do you say it's accusatory, John? It's not simply, I just want to add here, he's not simply speculating, right? This is not the Maimonides sitting and figuring out the problem of evil. Right. right. This is very clearly accusatory. Why do you say so? Because it's not so. It's. It, I mean, it's happening on the ground in a way that why are you asleep is a little different. But yes. saying this is something that shouldn't be happening. Why are you letting it happen? And how so do you know that? How do you know that? Because um, the the grammar in um, right when he says uh, uh, where is it? Yehu um, gamasu. Uh, right. Like. And more importantly, pasuk bet nitatam gam You planted them, right? Right? You did this, right? You're they're successful. That's great. You know what? Fine, but you're doing it, right? It's you. You're behind, right? Again, we're back at that accusation of you, right? You, okay? Right. And this is, you know, people should read this more often. I just say, I just say, okay. But anyway, okay, fine. And again, and also I would add here in verse three, right? Um, he. Very similar to the speakers in 44, in Tilim Memdalid, he says here, you know, and you can check, right? Go ahead, check, right? And it's not me, right? I'm not one of those bad people. You know I'm a, a good guy, right? So again, you have this, what I would call a protestation of innocence, or at least a, um, a willingness, a, you know, openness to, to engage in a, uh, let's call it a willingness to be examined, Right, mm-hmm. and I'm willing. The same bachanta here, yedatani, and is very similar to the language. Very, you know, kind of in my head in, of Tehilim Mem Dalid pasuk kaf bet. Halo Elohim yachakor zot. Let him examine this. Right, chakar is one of these today. Modern Israeli uses it for this kind of a thing for um, forensics. Right, you know, there's, this is. Go examine this. You can, you know, right? You can go investigate, right? These are all these investigatory terms that saying, I'm willing, we speakers are willing to be investigated because we know we're okay. Yes. So, uh-huh. And maybe you'll get to this. Yes. Um, but I'm wondering with this example, this great detail, maybe because it's not, maybe because it's more in the context already of tefillah. Right. Or, yes. Or, or some sort of different mode that yeah. he's, he asked for a result in a way that neither. Correct. Okay, so. Um, on some level, yes, there is a very clear, what we call, what lawyers like to call remedy sought. Yeah. Right, remedy sought, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you look at the end of Memdalad, which you have the end of Memdalad, the last verse is the only place where they actually say what they want. Right. right? And there you say, Kuma ezrat alanu uftenu leman chastem. Yeah. Okay, so yes. So that the, and that's the end, that's actually the end of the chapter. So that's the last verse. That's where they actually ask for something. Yeah. In 22, you also have, it's, it's, it's there, and it, what, if you, you know, kind of, Thinking about tefillah in this forensic uh, mode, you begin to say when you when you ask for what you want, that's what the point is that the remedy sought. Right? You yeah. you state your grievance and then you get you get your remedy sought. You, you you somehow mention it what you want to have happen. Okay. Now let's look at one more example of a tefillah, really a tefillah. All right, this is the a paradigmatic example. Vaychal Moshe. This is chapter twenty thirty two of the Sefer Shemot. Vaychal Moshe Pnei Hashem Elokav. Right. This is in the way, the uh, wake of the golden calf. And there we have our, right at the start, right? The first word, just like in chapter 22 of Sefer Tilim, Okay? So, how is this similar to our examples? At this point, we already see it, right? This is an, again, we don't want God to be angry. This is not something we, and we don't, we're not even expecting an answer. It's actually accusing God, right, of being angry, right? Now, of course, let's remember, what's the, uh, the stakes are high, right? The, he's been told, I will turn you into a na- I'll make a nation out of you and wipe you out. Wipe everybody else out and start, start again, right? So why be ang- Why are you angry? Okay. Now, Lama Yomiru Mitzrayim, this is not exactly in line with my thing, right? Lama Yomiru Mitzrayim, why should they be able to say, right? Here, I don't think this is accusatory. I don't think the second Lama is in the same as the first Lama. Um, and what is he doing here? 
it, it, what is his, his strategy here is to say, you're going to look bad in, in the second, in the Pasuk Yud Bet, right? They should not be able to say, right, that he could, all he could do is to throw him, to, to kill them in the desert, right? Or, you know, to kill them in the mountains in this case, right? There's the parallel example in chapter 13 of Sefer Bimidbar, he says, it's much more elaborate, but just longer, so I left it out. But he talks about how if the people will hear that you, that, that you, you, know, you slaughtered them in the desert, they'll say, oh, well, he couldn't get them to Israel, right? So your PR is bad for the PR. It's got bad optics, right? That's the, the term right now. Bad optics for you. Yes, Frida. Well, so, I mean, just look at verse 11. Because yes. The, back, the background to this is that they really screwed up this time period. Yes, well, we know that we know we as readers know that, right? We know the guilty, you know, that we know that they did something wrong, and we know that God is, you know, not not happy. So fine, he doesn't say that they did anything that they didn't do something wrong, right? Um, he simply asks, you know, he but he says to God, "You're getting you're getting angry, right? You know, Lama, you know, why should you get angry, right?" And he tells him, "You can't wipe them out because you've got this deal." Right in chapter in verse thirteen, Pasuk Yud Gimel, he actually says, "Right, you've got this deal. You, you, you swore, you swore, right, that you're going to turn them into a big nation." Okay. It, it does seem a little bit Oh, look, he's a lawyer. Yeah. Right. Okay. He he's he's a you know yeah. Every defendant deserves a good lawyer. And if I had Moses as my lawyer, I'd be happy. You know, he yeah. and look. Um, the the if if you go back to this chapter it's 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 really brilliant because the the prayer is brilliant you can spend an hour on this just on this chapter um, and just on these verses but if you follow from what's before right he says to Moshe lech reid kishichet amcha your nation has done has messed up so Moshe comes back right exactly your kid is doing this oh your kid right it's exactly that and the rabbis pick it up right away right like they say like you know no banecha chatu no banecha chatu right you know like they go back and forth on this and um, so, you know, that, that's just the first step in this whole thing, right? But, but the Lama question, he's saying, you know, he's pointing a, 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 an accusing finger at God. So he's not, again, he's not asking for an answer, right? This is a rhetorical question with a sense of an accusation. Something is wrong here. Um, and I'm going to give you now, so to, to round out the, um, the claim that this is part of the forensic language, part of the courtroom uh, motif in Tfilah in the Tanakh, I will add... Uh, a verse that I did not um, include here, which is not a prayer, but is a, um, a scene from the earlier in the life of Moshe. In, um, and this, I, I, this is kind of gratis, not on the page. I'm sorry that I didn't put it, in, didn't include it. But um, Shmot, uh, Perek, um, where am I now? Perek, Bet, chapter 2 of Exodus, uh, verses 13 to 14. Okay, so... Um, chapter 2 of Exodus 13 to 14, Shmot Bet Yud Gimel Yud Dalin. This is right after he uh, kills the Egyptian. Right? Moses goes out and he, there's the Egyptian. Okay? Um, <coughs> I wonder if there's a. No, there isn't a Chumash here. It's, okay, it's fine. Okay? Um, and, he sa- and then the next day, what happens? Vayetze um, Bayom uh, Hasheni. Moshe goes out the second day. Vihine Shnei Anashim Ivrim Nitzim. Two Hebrews are. Uh, fighting, vayomer la rasha, and he said to the uh, wrong one, the one who's the, the, the smiter rather than the smitee, uh, vayomer la rasha, lama takere echa. Right? Why are you hitting your fellow man? Right? And there's our lama question. In again, he now you know I I don't I'm not asking you why. Oh, I'm hitting him because he whatever. No, you don't do that, right? I don't want you to do that. La mata kereyecha, and to um, add now to, this is sort of cements the point that this is that the lama question has a sort of a, a, a specifically let's call it a forensic uh, meaning a um, a courtroom valence or a legal valence because right after the response of this rasha, right, the wrong guy, the guy who's in the wrong. Right? Um, he says, Vayomer, the, the, presumably the Rasha says, Mi samcha le'ish sar v'shofet aleinu. Who made you judge on us? Right? Notice that, right? Of all the th- characters that they could have made Moshe, they made him into a judge right away, right? Mi samcha le'ish sar v'shofet aleinu. Ha lehorgeni ata omer kasher ragta tamitzri. And then, of course, the plot takes over, right? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday morning? And then now that's how Moshe finds out that he's got to go run to Midian because people know. Right? But the key for me is not so much what, what fits into the bigger plot, but rather that when Moshe asks, Lama takereyecha, why are you, why are you hitting your fellow man? Right? The answer is, who made you judge? Right? Who made you judge? Judge. Critical. Sabchali ish sarvishofet alein.
right? Who made you judge? So the question, Lama Takere Echan, perhaps I should have started with that rather than, oh, but okay, we got, we were talking about Tehillim, so we're good. So this Lama question is, you know, to some people, at least in the Tanakh, immediately signals that this guy is a judge. This guy is, this belongs in the discourse, okay? Now, and so um, my claim would be, inner biblically, without, before we turn to the extra biblical sources, which we'll get to in a second, we have some time, yeah, uh, is to say that these are, the same way that Moshe asks, Lama takere echa, right? Um, he asks God in chapter 32, Lama Hashem Right now, we're just now we're not we're not talking to a human. We're talking to God. But okay, but the the, lang, the the mode of discourse is the same, right? The question has the same force, the same accusatory force. You can, you know, a speaker can accuse God through prayer, right? Accuse God of something that of doing something that God should not, or you know, is disagreeable, right? Um, same is true in chapter twenty, uh, in chapter 24, 22 and forty four. Right? They engage God in a, I would say, you know, I would, you know my, the extreme formulation would be they, they attempt to sue God. Right? Um, and I would add here, I would say, you know, before we even turn to the extra-biblical stuff where, which confirms this, okay, um, the, um, I would say two things. Number one is, generally speaking, right, the, the question of why did you do this, right, even in American English, right, you, you, you often use it to accuse a person of something. Right, right. It's more than a question. It's 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 not a an informational question, right? right? It's not a why is the sky blue question or why, right? Why you know, you know, why did the chemical that I mixed into this turn this blue or whatever, right? No, it's a why question that accuses. We we were familiar with that rhetorically, and my point is simply to say, well, not only that, but this belongs in a specific sphere of discourse, which I would say is sort of the courtroom. I'd add to that before I even get to the extra biblical material, again, within the Tanakh, let's look at a few other, just a few things within these texts. Specifically, in chapter 44, you have this oath, right? Im shachachnu, in pasuk kaf aleph, right? That is, uh, in my mind, right, a, you know, the, the fact that you take an oath, well, when do you take an oath, right? Oaths belong in, are, are a part of legal discourse, right? Im shachachnu, shem elokeinu, and the numerous philot, do this. Numerous people do this. They will use an oath to um, bolster a claim of innocence. Right? We haven't done something, and I swear we haven't done something, or I haven't done something. Okay? Fine. And the tone is quite confident. Right? When you take an oath, you swear that you have. You know, you're. you're what? What? Because what is an oath in the end of the day? Right? Um, so help me God, right? Or may I, may I, may, you know, if, if the example that I like to give, if I forget the O Jerusalem in my right hand wither, right? You're willing to put your right hand on the line because you know you're never going to forget Jerusalem. Same thing is about the past, right? I have not done this. And, you know, you know, I, so help me God, meaning if I don't, if I have done this, you know, zap, right? And in a world that believes in, yeah the power, right, and it's still to some extent, whatever it, whatever that belief is today, but in the world of the Tanakh, this was for real, right? This meant something, and the idea was that if you took the oath, it was sufficient to demonstrate on some level, and I'm not getting into all the, you know, legal halakha, or whatever else, whatever happens later, but this, the, the oath is sufficient to say yeah. that if you swear to it, then you're willing to put your life on the line, so much so, and here I'll, I'll add, that, um, in certain periods of Mesopotamian law, we know that um, the imposition of the oath was sufficient to settle a case. If a person was willing or not willing to take the oath, that would prove to you that, the, that who, whether they were right or wrong. Because, um, so the, the, the judges would decide, so-and-so has to go to the oath. He swore, he didn't swear. That tells you whether he did it or not, right? Yeah, today it's hard to imagine people having that sense. Absolutely. Oh no, completely. Yeah, it's it's very no right. So exactly. So you know, but I, that's why you know this is you know, it's so it's God, right. God who right exactly. So it's almost funny in America, but it, but but in but in the ancient world, this was so meaningful that you would not you know you would so the hesitancy to take the oath would exact would prove that either you were right or you know, would prove something. Yes. I'm just wondering, uh, just a little bit of a side. Sure, go ahead, yeah. In between Yirmiyahu, where he says, where it's clearly like, Yariv Elecha. Yes. 
verses in Shemot where it's by Yechal. Yes. You, you, you're still doing this sort of similar, but I'm wondering, does that verb change? How you... Oh, of course, of yeah. course. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's different. It's not, you know, it's... There's chutzpah and then there's chutzpah, right? right. But, and um, I think Moshe, look, Moshe has to understand that this is, uh, you know, this is, he's not, he's backed against the wall. He's a defense attorney, you know, right? Clearly there's a case to be, that has to be made. Um, and yet, right? And Yeriyahu is, is just very much, you know, I'm innocent and, you, you know, you're in the wrong. Yes. The verb of Ayichal is yeah. associated as, as, as a legal type. I don't know about that. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. I, I've, I haven't done the work on that. I have okay. to admit that. I have okay. to admit that. that. Uh, but in the, the case of Yirmiyahu is interesting because he's at Mishpat, Ariv and, um, and Mishpatima Daberotach Madua, right? And so again, right? I'm in the courtroom. I'm going to take you to court. And here's why my charge is this. My charge is a question, right? My charge starts with a question. I'm not looking for an answer in court. I'm looking for fix it. Okay. Now let's look at these two examples on the back page, item three. E and F. Um, you have, um, one is a, they're about a thousand years apart, okay? Um, both in Akkadian, one from a place called Alalach, which is Tel Achana in, I want to say Syria today, I believe that's right, um, modern Syria. Um, and um, it is um, a, it's a, a record of a lawsuit Concerning the estate of Hammurabi's wife, this is not the famous Hammurabi. This is another one. There are lots of them out there. Um, it's a common enough name. Uh, his wife, um, Abael, brought suit against his sister, Bitati. Okay, well, that's, there's, a, uh, there's a will, there are relatives, right? Okay. Um, my grandmother was known to say, where, there are will, where there's a will, there are relatives. Um, <laughs> so, um, but Abael brought suit against his sister, Bitati. Um, thus he said, the entire house is mine. Betati, you have no part in it. Betati said thus, something or other broken to the, lost to the uh, ravages of time. Uh, through my mother, I have a part. Why, Aminim, that's the Akkadian, that's the word for why, do you seek an extra share? I, with you, together we should divide, shall divide our, father, our father's estate. My, my point here is what? What's, why, why does this, how does this connect to what we've been saying until now in the Tanakh? What is, how does her claim, how does her language fit into what we've been saying in the Tanakh? It's the same accusatory question. Right. Why do you seek another? Right. Exactly. There you have it. Right. So her response to his, you know, um, you, the entire house is mine, you have no part, right, is why do you seek another half? Right. Why do you seek an extra share? Right. You're seeking too much. You're getting too much out of this. And then they, they sued each other. They came before the king. And it turns out that she actually wins. Um, and actually, sorry, I think, yes. Um, he wins. Okay. Um, yes. He gets part and she gets a part too in the end of the day. Yeah. Well, it's, yes. She, he wins, but she wins too. It's a little bit complicated exactly how this works out. It's fine. Um, this is for another time about this. It's, it's much more, it gets more complicated because this is a very good, this is an example of what we call table turning, which in modern law you're not really supposed to do, which is that you can take a lawsuit, somebody brings a lawsuit against you and you can say, no, actually, right, um, you, it's your problem. It's, it's a problem with you. This is, this is one of the rare examples where you have that. But, okay. But my, my point here is more the rhetorical point, which is why do you look for another, uh, an extra share? And a thousand years later in um, a temple in Uruk, um, which is biblical Erech, right? Mentioned in Parshat Noach. Um, um, uh, you have here a, an oblate, which is sort of a, somebody under the authority in some way of the temple of Ishtar of Uruk, which is where, just you know, for, for the record, many of, most of what we know about cuneiform, about civilization in this period, the Neo-Babylonian period, comes from basically two temples, two temple archives that survive in uh, cuneiform. One from the temple of Uruk, the other from the city of uh, Sippar, which is further north. Okay. Um, uh, for the, they, they, uh, he comes and reports some, some man, this Ibn Nabu comes and reports that for the past 10 years, Anu Shar Utsu, the official in charge of the building wing, illegally removed many things from the storehouse in my charge, right? He's been taking things off on the side, right? He's got a store, this guy, Ibn Nabu has, uh, is responsible for this storehouse. He's in charge of the storehouse. And this official has been coming and pilfering stuff, taking things with, you know, with, and, and, Obviously, he's defending himself here, right? Ibn Nabu is saying, I'm not, I didn't, you know, the, the, 
even the accounts don't match up, not because of me, but because some guy's been taking things from me. So now, now the official, the, uh, the um, judicial authorities or the authorities in the temple, Nabumu Kinapli, someone, the official at the Ayana, said thus to Ibn Nabu, why did you not report this to the Shatamu or the royal official who was appointed before me? And after I was appointed, why did you not report it? Now, whatever you see in his possession, bring and show us. Again, now what? Somewhat of a table turning also. Why did you not do this, right? What should he have done? He should have reported that some guy is taking stuff, right? You've got 10 years of some guy coming and taking things out of your storeroom. You figured it out. You know who's in charge, who's responsible, and you know who did the problem, and you know who to talk to. Why did you not report them? Okay, right? So it's not just a good question. It is actually you're at fault, right? You are, right? It's a problem, right? And you, and there it is, that accusatory why once again. And again, in a context of a, you know, close enough to a trial that we would be okay, right? Certainly in the first text, in the text from Allah, the why is coming in the back and forth between two litigants. Here in the second example, it's more of, a, you know, you want to call it criminal, you can call it criminal. It's the institution investigating its workers, right? Um, but again, using the why, okay? So what we've, what all of this uh, is to show you that the use of why in um, what, 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 we, what, we're, what we're doing here, what I, why I go to these um, extra biblical texts is to simply show you the use of why, of why accusatory why, right? The equivalent of lama in um, completely, what we, let's call them secular settings, right? Settings that are not dealing with, um, not talking to God, right? They are talking to each other. They're talking to humans. Even in the temple, they're not actually praying, right? This guy, it's the temple as the administrative body, not the temple as, you know, temple with a capital T, uh, you know, some sort of locus of connection to God, right? There is somewhere there, the gods are part of this whole story, but most of what we know about this temple um, from, uh, is, you know, all the, the day-to-day, the grind of how many sheep make it in and out and all that stuff. You know, what religious experience took place there is, uh, God only knows. or the gods only know um, in this case. Yes, exactly. Um, but the point is that in the interhuman context, you use the why, and just like Moshe did, right? La mata kere echa. Right? Why did you do, right? You use it to accuse. Okay? And so what we've done here is we've demonstrated the use of why, let's call it in the earthly courtroom, right? Beit in Shilmata, right? And, um, and the Mizmorei Tehillim apply that to Beit in Shilmata or incorporate the Beit in Shilmata language, the, the, the language of the lower court, of the earthly court, in, uh, confronting God. And that, I think, is what, we, what we're seeing in the two examples that I gave you, plus the other examples of why questions in Sefer Tehillim, where you address them to God. Why? Um, you, are addre- you are saying, God, something is wrong. And it's not just wrong overall. It's wrong because you're doing something wrong, right? And I would suggest here that, th- that this is, um, you're entering into, you're bringing God, you're dragging God to court. You're saying to God, you're wrong and I'm right and you, and I'm, I, this is at least my day in court to the speakers, right? And my day in court against you, God. Now this, and this, um, you know, I drop this, you know, as I, I say, this idea um, comes, emerges for me from this uh, constellation of the inner biblical, you know, simply the, the, the biblical, um, the, the rhetoric of the Mizmorei Tehillim, the similarities to other places in Tanakh, as well as to the ancient Near Eastern courtroom. Now, the implications of this spin out, you know, amazingly, in the sense of what is this, what are these prayers then, right? What is tefillah um, all about? It's not, as we said earlier, it's not, it's surprisingly not about self-abasement. It's not about, you know, I, I'm all wrong and you're all right. So, you know, there are places where that's the case, but not here, not in these, right? Now, we can talk about those at some other time, but the ones here are saying, no, actually, we are in a, much closer to a dialogue of, you know, the courtroom is leveling the playing ground, right? The playing field, right? There's a level playing field. Um, and, you know, if you want to talk about how this happened or why this happened, I would suggest that, you know, the... Um, this is one of the biggest problems in religion: is how do you figure out the, the earthly connect the earthly to the to the uh, to the human, right? The earthly to the, to the divine, right? You know, and especially in a world where in a in a worldview that has only one such divinity, yeah. right? Only one such deity, right? There's not like you can you know they're not like a committee 
right? It's this one guy with all the power and lots of people without it, feeling without it. And the feeling of desperation, you know, could, par could, be, par could, be, par uh, could be paralyzing. And somehow the courtroom, by bringing God to court, by treating God as um, a litigant would, and by addressing God as a litigant might, you've actually bridged that chasm and you've opened something up here. Um, you know, how to incorporate that, I leave that to each individual <laughs> theologian and speaker in prayer. But that's what I, my claim is that, you know, in these, in these specific examples with the why questions, you begin to you bring God uh, into the courtroom and you say, you know, you say like, well, we're going to sue you. Uh, let's, you know, now, um, right, exactly. But, you know, the, at least rhetorically. That's what I have to say here. Um, okay. Um, I guess we have a few minutes, a few seconds, a few minutes for questions. If anyone has any questions, um, yeah. There's an element of chutzpah. I'm just repeating the question because of the recording. There's an element of chutzpah. Yeah. Um, maybe that's uh, so. The most chutzpahic part of me wants to say that maybe we're wrong about the definition of chutzpah. Like, what are the boundaries? Like, what you know, chutzpah is in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, you know, yes. All of us sitting here in 2022 would never talk to somebody with that much power in that way. But maybe speaking truth to power is a form of respect, right? Or is expected, right? Maybe it's, um, or maybe prayer is a safe space, right? Oh. What we do in prayer is not necessarily um, even communal prayer, right? The, 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 the setting of tefillah allows for that. Um, uh, you know, maybe God wants it in some level, right? Wants to keep, keep that connection going. Keep your, you know, make your case. Just talk, just talk, you know, anything. Because the, the worst thing, worse than this is to cut it off completely, silence. right? Is silence, right? On either end of it, right? The problem in Psalm 22 is the silence. You're not answering, right? So I have to talk. Right, says the speaker. So I'm, I'm, so I, that's the, that's the most chutzpahic part of me saying that maybe not, right? Maybe also, maybe, um, you know, I, I think that's, I think, the real answer here. I think that's the right answer. It makes a lot of sense because it's, it's like an intimate love relationship. Yes, right. You can say pretty much anything you want. Um, and um, it's, uh, it, 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 now, look, you know, there are, there, look, there are whole lines of thought that would view this as, you know, Heretical. Heretical or whatever. Um, I'm left with this in front of me, right? This is, yes, Freda. No, I was just saying, you use that phrase, speak truth to power. Right. Uh, I, to the best of my knowledge, that came into the popular usage from a uh, Quaker pacifist of a couple of generations. Sure. Of Musty, and when they are speaking truth to power, they're speaking it to the really bad guys. Right. I mean, f because of their religious basis, they have some confidence that they're going to survive this. Not because of the goodness of the bad guys, but because maybe God will look out for them. But it's a, this speak truth to power to God, it's a different kind of power. Sure, yes, yes. And um, if you read the book of Job, I, uh, on some readings, there are those who would say that's the point of the book of Job, is that Job oh. speaks truth to the power, right? To power with a P. That's not my idea. That, that I owe to Edward Greenstein. You it over. I just... it's, no, right. So the, the, the Edward Greenstein's reading of the book of Job is that, and in his reading, God doesn't come out looking so good. Um, um, uh, which is, look, that, that's a radical reading. Um, and um, we can discuss that. But, the, but there is something... Um, liberating <laughs> to it, um, and I say as 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 as, as Neil said, right? The the, um, the 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 love relationship is what it's built on, right? The um, the the, um, the 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 divine willingness. To, you want to you know get cabalistic about it to even enter into this world at all is an act of love, right? The, the all the, the, that this infinite power, right? Um, you know, and the Bible is everything about God's power, right? God is the power, you know, with capital P in big, bold letters. Um, but the act of, th that in the end of the day, God, and God makes that choice, right? God doesn't have to enter into any relationship with anyone, and yet does, right? Uh -huh. And that's, that's, that's a biblical idea, right? The idea that God wants a covenant is that God wants a covenant, right? That God has to, you have to want that. Now that you know the question is whether God needs it too is an interesting question. But uh, okay, all right.